Members, one o'clock having arrived, I'm going to call the March 24th, 2021 meeting of the uh, Taxes Committee uh, to order under Rules 10.01. And with that, uh, Ms. Griska, would you please call the roll? Marcourt. Present. Marcourt, present. Liz Lagarde. Present. Liz Lagarde, present. Davids. Davids, present. Davids, present. Abaje. Present. Abaje, present. Carlson. Carlson, present. Carlson, present. Detmer. Detmer, present. Detmer, present. Garofalo. Garofalo, present. Garofalo, present. Gomez. Gomez, present. Gomez, present. Her. Her, present. Her, present. Hertas. Hertas, present. Hertas, present. Howard. Present. Howard, present. McDonald. Old McDonald, present. McDonald, present. Miller. Miller, present. Miller, present. Moran. Present. Moran, present. Mortensen. Present. Mortensen, present. Robbins. Present. Robbins, present. Sandell. Present. Sandell, present. Schultz. Present. Schultz, present. Stevenson. Present. Stevenson, present. Swazinski. Present. Swazinski, present. Joachim. Present. Joachim, present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much, Ms. Griska. We do have a quorum. Uh, we're going to move to approval of the minutes. Representative Leslie Gard, have you thoroughly reviewed those March 23rd, 2021 minutes? Would you care to make a motion to approve? So move, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Leslie Gard moves approval of the March 23rd, 2021 minutes. Any discussion or comments on those? If not, members, I'm going to ask you to temporarily unmute yourselves as we take the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Say nay. The motion does prevail. The March 23rd, 2021 minutes of the Taxes Committee are approved. Uh, members, a little bit of changes on schedules that have come out, although I think the latest one was the correct one as we made some changes. But... We're going to hear four bills as the intent this afternoon, and we're going to start with uh, Representative Franson's bill, and then we're going to do the beginning farmer credit bill, and then the two that were originally up, the bill on the global intangible world tax income and the worldwide combined reporting. And then we're going to recess and then come back tonight at 6 o'clock uh, to do uh, two other bills, which is... Uh, uh, Representative Hansen uh, on uh, deed transfer mortgage tasks for uh, soil and water conservation districts and Representative Les Lagarde's bill on the film tax credit. And so with that, uh, we're going to start uh, with House File um, 2293, Representative Franson's bill. Do I hear a motion to for that bill? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Representative Wazinski? Yes, Mr. Chair, I move to move uh, 20, that Franz and Bill forward before the committee. Also, are we'll be voting on any bills today, moving them out, or are we just hearing for possible? Very motion? good. So before I take that motion, uh, great question. Yes, we will be uh, voting on House File 1733, and that will be sending it back to... Uh, the Authors Committee on Environment. So it'll be that one tonight, nothing this morning, or nothing this afternoon. Representative Swazinski, would you care to move House File 17, no, 2293? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move uh, House File 2293 before the Tax Committee for possible inclusion. All right, then be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much. Representative Franson, welcome to the Taxes Committee. And I know you also have a DE1 amendment. So Representative Swazinski, would you like to move the DE1 amendment? Uh, 
I will move the DE1 amendment. Uh, Representative Franson, what does Thank the you. DE1 amendment do, or does it put it in the um, form you want, and then we'll go from there? Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, first off, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have been going back and forth for almost a year now on this bill. Well, actually, it's been over a bill, uh, over a year. When we were going to take this bill up last year is when we were sent home uh, due to the uh, COVID shutdown of the legislature. So thank you for allowing me to present um, this bill. Uh, so last year, last February, there was a so Representative uh, Franson, we need to uh, uh, move the DE1 oh, amendment. And so that is it, that's just, I think, going to put the bill in its proper form. So yeah. let's let's take a vote on that first. Any questions or comments before we take that vote? Seeing none, I'm going to ask for the vote on the DE1 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The motion does prevail. The DE1 amendment is adopted. To your bill, Representative Franzen, as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I was saying, uh, there was a devastating fire last February that took out a big chunk of a block uh, in downtown Alexandria on Broadway there, of which um, those buildings are very historic. Uh, there was some need for uh, removal of asbestos. Uh, there's a lot of costs associated with the downtown fire. So basically, this bill provides an exemption from the sales tax and use tax uh, for the cleaning, replacing, remediation of the damage. Um, and then also we're asking for an exemption to the sales and purchases made after February 20th mm -hmm. and before uh, February 28th, 2023. And I also have my constituents from Alexandria, one of which uh, they owned Rapper's Bar and Grill on that block, uh, that entire uh, business was burnt and demolished. And there is now, there is just an empty uh, square block with dirt there where the historic building um, once stood. And I have Andy and Cami Rasset, uh, who were, who are still the owners of Rapper's Bar and Grill, um, but to speak to this bill and on behalf of the other mm -hmm. individuals that were affected by the fire. Very good. So um, we've got uh, Cami Rasset and Andy Rasset, and I would, we've got a number of bills today. So I would ask testifiers to keep their testimony to uh, three minutes. And mm -hmm. so who would like to go first? Oh, they're together. All right. Very good. So as you speak, welcome to the committee. If you would introduce yourself before mm -hmm. you speak and then begin your testimony. Thank you. I am Cami. Um, my husband, Andy. I am Andy. First of all, we just wanna say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been a tough year um, as everybody else has had too, but we just wanna thank you in advance for just even considering this for us. So uh, long story short, we'll make it fast. Um, 26 years ago, we were just kids. We looked at downtown and what did it need? It needed, uh, it needed, some, it needed some life, it needed a sports bar. So that's what we built um, for the last 24 years. That has been our home. That has been our spot in Alec. Um, as far as being part of the community. Um, a year ago, um, that fateful day, we had uh, a huge fire that broke out and took four buildings in downtown, um, two of them which we owned um, and two of them that were owned by two other business owners. I guess we must have drew, drew the short straw today and we're here um, talking for everybody. So what we're asking for is a little help in um, the costs that exceeded um, our insurance that just didn't cover it. Um, with the old buildings, we didn't realize the amount of um, asbestos, lead um, that were in those buildings. So we have a big gap. Um, and that big gap has been really hard in um, moving forward um, to rebuild, to fill that void downtown and be a part of our community again. So that is basically what, what we're asking for. Um, there was a lot of asbestos, the lead, um, the chemical that was used to, um, the chemical that was used to put the fire out. Um, so I guess that is the hidden expenses is what we're really looking for your help to offset those so that we can go forward 
and um, be a part of our vital downtown again. And, and that's what the other business owners are looking for too. So Andy. just, you know, Andy, because of the cost, the cost of, uh, you know, primarily like 30%, we're just looking to, to offset that to rebuild, hopefully rebuild in the future and fill the whole downtown of uh, block five. It's half of half of block was destroyed. And I know Alexandria is missing it. And a lot of people visit this area and they want to, they want us to want us to fill it. And they've been asking us for over a year, what we're going to do. And now we can possibly move on. Well, thank you, uh, Andy and Cami for uh, representing the business district uh, in those damage. Uh, you've done very well. And, and hopefully the committee can be uh, of some some help as little as it can be granted your you know what you've gone through hopefully uh, we can provide some assistance um representative uh Yoakim. i just want to thank the testifiers for being here today and i'm so sorry about the loss of your business that took you so many years to build it must be like losing your home away from home um i hope that we can include this in the tax bill because in minnesota when when disaster strikes and it's out of your control, we help rebuild. And that's what we should be doing all over the state. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rep Representative McDonald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question for uh, Cami and Tammy, uh, kind of like the Beatles. Hopefully what you'll get. Um, just curious on the old historic building you have, uh, are you able to rebuild to a similar specs uh, and have that same old charm of those old hundred year old buildings? Uh, with the yeah, current Randy money. Rasset? Uh, we'd, we'd love to, you know, most of them are all made out of brick. Um, so we don't know what, you know, the future will hold for that. Honestly, it's, it's with construction costs right now. It's um, our, our two buildings. Yeah. We're built back in the 1800s and it's, it's hard to redo all the brick basements. You know, it was, the, the structure was, was pretty much brick and shared the adjoining foundations, which is tough to do that nowadays. Our hope is to fill something in that that is um, pretty congruent to what it looks like, um, even if it's under the new stipulations. Obviously, if to put sprinklers, sprinklers and elevators and um, added expenses, but our goal is to put something in that will look awesome downtown and not look like it didn't belong there. We want something that looks pretty original. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I think you'll find that uh, uh, sympathetic, this committee is very sympathetic and understands the situation. And um, we are, you know, we see a lot of these bills that uh, Representative McDonald, you're for the materials breaking up a little. Kind of have a blanket help for like five down or you know. Oh, I'll just. Uh, I just said I, I support the bill and certainly helping our friends uh, who uh, lost their homes or their businesses to fires and stuff. Uh, I'm an old hundred year old historic building, so I know how devastating that is to businesses uh, from Alexandria to Minneapolis to Delano. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mary Francis, for bringing it to our attention. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Representative That's Denver. It. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, yeah, we, we've supported bills like this in the past. And, uh, and I think we will hopefully we can support this bill. I have a question, though. Is, did only the Viking survive? He's good. He's good. <laughs> he's good. He doesn't have a place to get a beer from anymore, but he's OK. OK. Sounds know, like he's doing all right. <laughs> My wife, uh, my wife graduated from uh, the high school there in Alec, and okay. uh, so it's uh, we've been there a few times. So it's a it's a beautiful little it's a beautiful city. It's growing. I know that. So yes. thank you, thank you. Um, anyone else on Zoom that would like to testify on House File twenty two ninety three as amended? See none. Representative Franson, um, closing comments. I just want to thank uh, the committee for their time and thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to bug you during the interim as well on this topic. So, Thank you very much, Representative Franson. So Representative Swazinski renews his motion to lay over House File 2293 as amended. 
uh, for possible inclusion into the House Tax Omnibus Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Franson, Andy, and Cammie, thank you for testifying today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn the meeting over for the next two bills to uh, Vice Chair Wesselgaard. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next bill on the agenda is 1456 from Representative Marcourt. Marcourt, would you like to move your bill? I will move House File 1456 for possible inclusion into the Omnibus Tax Bill. And I do have an A2 amendment if I could move that right now, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Marquardt moves that the A2 author's amendment uh, be uh, adopted. Representative Marquardt, please explain to the committee your amendment. Yeah, that it basically uh, puts the bill into the form I would like. So if we could get this approved and then I could speak to the bill as amended. Okay, any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 Aye, okay, good. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Marquard, to your bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, House File 1456 now is amended, uh, is an attempt to expand what has been really a very successful program and it's the beginning farmer's tax credit. And it was enacted into law in 26, 2017 uh, with the leadership of Chair Davids. In that tax bill and he uh, really pushed this bill it was nation leading i don't know if there's any there was another uh, type of program like this that chair david's pushed and the whole concept was to get more young people into farming in minnesota the average age of a farmer is 55 years old and in the united states there are six times more farmers over the age of 65 than there are under the age of 35. And so the whole intent is to be able to, as these older farmers retire and get out of the business, how do we get younger ones to replace them? That is a real concern. And so uh, this bill was set up and a beginning farmer is someone who's been in farming 10 years or less. Uh, their main occupation is going to be farming. Uh, they're experienced in that. And as part of the bill, they may be required to attend a financial management class. And that is also covered up to $1,500 uh, credit for up to three years. So it's kind of a, you know, it, it not only tries to incentivize young farmers, beginning farmers, but also make sure they get off to a good financial uh, basis. And uh, the rural Finance Authority is uh, through the MBA is the division that kind of administers this. And so how it works is uh, on a sale of property or land, um, the owner of that land uh, would be able to get like a 5% credit up to a maximum of 32,000. And then on rent, it's either 10 or 15% up to like 7,000 or $10,000 based upon whether or not it's a shared rent agreement or not, but it's providing a tax credit to the owner. And so what has it done in the last few years since it started? Uh, $6 million has been appropriated, that's a cap. And in 2018, there's 378 beginning farmers who participate in 2019, it was 527 and in 2020, 444. And the average expenditure has been about $2.7 million and those dollars are carried forward. So right now in the program, there's about $12 million um, that's in the cap right now or would be available. So what my amendment, what the bill does isn't anything with increasing funding, it's try to increase access. And one thing about the bill is there's gonna be a study that is gonna be due on February 1st. Uh, when this was passed in 2017, it had a sunset. There'll be a study on February 1st of 2022. And then this program would sunset uh, after tax year 2023. And if I had my druthers, I would look at extending it, but I think we should uh, see the report first. I mean, I think that's due diligence and we still have 22 and 23 to extend it. So that bill is, this bill isn't doing that either. So three parts, what this would do is extend it to family members. Right now, family members are excluded. 
And so it would be sons, daughters, and grandchildren. And there certainly are some safeguards that would be put up just because of a family to a family situation. And that is, this only involves uh, land or equipment sales. It does, the family um, addition does not um, apply to any of the rent situation. And a further guardrail on this is that if it's a, you know, assessed land, uh, it would have to be sold at 100% of the assessed value or higher. And if they don't know the assessed value, it's 80% or more of the market value. But we know that uh, in a lot of cases, uh, the children of farmers are not coming back and farming. And it's, it's difficult. This would help keep that also uh, in the generational family farm. A second uh, provision in there is that it would raise the 5% to 10% uh, of uh, the value of the 32,000 on the sale for socially uh, disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. And that uh, would allow more people of color, emerging farmers to become part of that. That definition is actually part of the uh, USDA. It's, it was um, put into law in 1990. So that would expand and help get more emerging farmers involved. And the last and final thing this bill does, it provides some funding, uh, basically 5% of the allocation of 6 million, which would be $300,000 to the Rural Finance Authority. And for not only do they implement this right now and administer and they make sure beginning farmers qualify and help them and so forth, but right now there is no online application, no online application for and everything has to be by paper. And this would also help establish that. So members, uh, that is uh, the bill. And again, I thank Chair Davids for uh, being a leader on this program that we're actually seeing some pretty good success. I would be open for questions. And I Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we do have a couple testifiers. Uh, the first one is Mr. Clover. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Leslie Gard and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Brad Clover. I know it comes up with James. I go by my middle name. Um, I'm here to testify in support of uh, Chair Marcourt's bill to expand the beginning farmer tax credit. I farm currently with my family just outside of Northfield, and this tax credit over the last couple of years has been a big help to me as I've gotten established on the farm. Um, been farming coming up on four years now on my own outside of what my parents do, and the majority of that time I spend raising hogs. Um, I've been able to utilize that beginning farmer tax credit over the last couple of years on the pigs that I'm purchasing to bring into my barn. Um, I got uh, kind of partnered up with a neighboring family farm just outside of near strand. And then I buy a group of feeder pigs every 16 weeks, raise them up to market. Um, but that tax credit um, by them selling the livestock to me, we've been able to, to capitalize on the tax credit. They, they get the advantage on that side. Um, but really it, it's helped me as a beginning farmer, I don't have a whole lot of equity. Um, it's tough to get started. So last year was uh, challenging. Um, so going through all of those challenges with, with the lows and the hog prices and everything, because of that tax credit, we've, we've been able to kind of facilitate that, that relationship and there was some give and take on the prices. So they were able to give me a little bit more of a break on the pigs uh, that I purchased. Um, so that way I could continue farming. Um, so it's been a huge boon on that side, expanding it further to cover the, the sale of agricultural assets to kids and grandkids. Uh, makes sense with the idea of generational farm transition. Um, that that transition piece has been a very hot topic in my family of late. My father is approaching uh, 65, getting closer to wanting to retire and looking at how to transfer that land and everything into the next generation and get my brother and I started. Um, it's a challenge. So by having that, that tax incentive um, to be able to 
to sell some of that land to my brother and I, um, it would allow us to get our foot in the door more on, on the family operation as well. Um, increasing the credit for socially disadvantaged farmers would give emerging farmers an added leg up and help them get established in their operations. And finally, giving the department the funding they need to put together an online application will make it much easier to access the, the credit. Um, that's doing the, the handwritten application takes a little more time. I, I like to be able to do things on the computer, so I know that would save me a little time on that. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to share my support and how I've been able to utilize the program thus far, and um, I'm happy to stand for any questions anyone may have. Thank you, Mr. Clover, uh, and I thank you for sharing your story. Um, next up, we have Ms. Kohler. Please welcome to the committee and introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amanda Kohler. I'm a policy organizer at the Land Stewardship Project. Um, LSP is a grassroots people-driven organization. Our mission is to foster an ethic of stewardship for farmland, promote sustainable agriculture, and develop healthy communities. One of the Land Stewardship Project's greatest priorities is to train beginning farmers, sustain established farmers, and grow the number of farmers on the land. LSP supports the passage of this bill as amended. The Beginning Farmer Tax Credit, um, as many folks have already said, is one tool through which our state currently invests in supporting beginning farmers. LSP members originally crafted the bill that led to the establishment of this program um, back in, I think, 2006. Uh, we created this to invest in training and financial support for young and beginning farmers. Since then, we've advocated for changes to ensure that it, the support is prioritized for those beginning farmers who need it most. Black, brown, indigenous people, people without inheritable land or assets, women, and people with disabilities. Therefore, we strongly support the provision in this bill that increases the tax credit for sale of land or assets to socially disadvantaged farmers. Due to the impacts of centuries of structural racism and theft, loss of land from these communities, beginning farmers who are black, brown, and indigenous, immigrants of color, or refugees face the greatest barriers to accessing land, capital, and assets. This bill is a step toward addressing these injustices, one of many steps that are needed. Um, while I'm talking right now, we actually have another LSP member in the Ag Committee talking about the emerging farmer uh, the bill that is also another one of these important steps. Um, so while we support this, and we also support allowing for 5% of the funds to be used for administration and to develop an online application, this is a sensible investment as strengthening the accessibility and administration will increase the effectiveness of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kohler. Um, we do not have any other testifiers. Um, member questions for the testifiers or Chair Markward? I see Chair Davids. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Liz Lizelgard, Chair Lizelgard. And I'm extremely disappointed in the last testifier. That this is a good bill. Of course, it's a good bill because I did it originally. So we know it's a good bill, but they have to bring up systemic racism and injustices on Chairman Marquardt's bill is simply, well, it's extremely unfortunate that we have to go down that road. Let's actually talk about the bill and what it does. Uh, according to what the first testifier was saying, he, he was right on. What we need to do is we need to help beginning farmers farm. We've all heard the average age of the farmer and so forth. And in the past, as Chair Marcourt knows, I had concerns about uh, between family members, uh, between family members, and Chair Marcourt has put in safeguards that uh, take away my concern uh, for those issues between family members. There, the way it was originally proposed some years ago, the Atlanta Stewardship uh, uh, had proposed and wanted, it was very loose, and there could be shenanigans, Tom Poolery and Skullduggery uh, built into the way we were very satisfied with uh, Chair Marquardt's uh, guardrails around this. But let's talk about getting farmers to farm and get beginning farmers in. And let's cut out the racism and the social injustice in the past. This is the tax committee. This is a tax issue. Let's create good tax policy 
for Minnesotans, which is what Representative Markworth's bill does. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chair Davids. Uh, next up, we have Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and also Chair Marcourt. A good, a good bill. Um, I know that you know I grew up on a dairy farm between near Strand and Fairbolt, as uh, I see James uh, smiles smiles over there. Um, it uh, was a farm that my grandfather homesteaded uh, back uh, many, many, many years ago. But uh, say, uh, Chair Marcourt, do you, I see you have to be a Minnesota resident? Uh, to qualify. How about a U.S. citizen? Do you need to be a U.S. citizen? Chair Marquardt. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Denver. I'm looking through the Department of Agricultural here definition. It says a Minnesota resident. Um, that's as far as it says. And I don't know if, if there's staff that could clarify that or not, but it's Minnesota resident uh, who is um, Mr. Uh, yeah. Williams? It doesn't say anything more than that, so I would. And Mr. Chair, the I reason why, I, Mr. Chair, the reason why I, I asked that question, you know, that there are uh, other countries that are trying to buy up land and so forth. Um, I would hope that this bill would apply to a U.S. citizen and Minnesota resident. Well, Mr. Chair, and. Um, Representative Denver, I mean, I'm not changing anything on residency, so that is the current law, and I'm, there's no changes on that. So Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative, any follow-up? No, I, I, that was just my question. I wanted to make sure that uh, that was part of the language that it, uh, you had to be a U.S. citizen. Okay. Thank you. Well, you can't talk about farming without talking to uh, Representative McDonald, so... Um, <laughs> I had to say it. I mean, certainly, it, was like, certainly. it was like on a tee. So yeah, I, I teed it up for you and you hit you it very did. well. 300 yards better than <laughs> Chair Davids could probably hit it up. So question. <laughs> yes. Although I did grow up in uh, the city of Watertown, I spent a lot of time on old McDonald's farm. And uh, so uh, I I'm certainly have no farming. Well, the question I have for Mr. the chairman a representative of Marcourt. We had a, a very good friend of ours who uh, grew up on the farm. He was, uh, I think, at the age 21 or 23. And after this bill passed, I think two years ago, I shared it with the mother because this young lad from Delano wanted to purchase some land out in the country and, and farm. And uh, he grew up the farm, hard worker. I mean, he would be the epitome of a great farmer. He wanted to raise some cattle and uh, grow some hay and uh, some alfalfa and such. Anyway, he couldn't get a, a bank loan. Now he had, you know, no, he didn't have bad credit. He just was a young, young man. I really thought this program would be able to help him. He went from bank to bank to bank, and uh, I tried to do what I could to help him. But he is the, the young man, the kind of person that we want this bill to help, that actually wants to go into farming and, uh, and do it well. Um, but he just couldn't find a loan or, you know, just couldn't get it. So uh, just wondering what your thoughts are and if you uh, experienced this in your research or any help that you can give that I can um, share with him. Chair Marquardt. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative McDonald. I mean, that's a great question. And uh, I mean, we know it is difficult for young people to get into farming because there's a lot of capital costs just to be able even to get the land that might be available uh, there. Uh, but I was, as I was kind of doing more research on this, I read an article where a young family uh, trying to, to you know, get into farming, uh, usually uh, one of the spouses has to have another job to get health insurance. Um, a lot of times there's just all sorts of upfront costs. It's very difficult. And that's why one part of this program is where the Rural Finance Authority will step in and, and help uh, folks at least get through the management, the financial management, which could help them get loans and that type of thing. But I, I don't have much more to add to that than just generally, it is difficult for young people, young farmers to get into the business. Representative McDonald, any follow-up? Uh, thank you, Representative Listegard. Uh, yes, if uh, I like the way you say it, I have chickens <laughs> behind us. See these chickens? Hopefully, these boys someday will grow up and uh, stay on the family farm as well. But that's not who I'm talking about. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Marquardt, for the bill. I do support this. Maybe the the testifier from the rural 
authority, the rural, uh, I forget her name, but she testified earlier. Perhaps she could reach out to me and uh, help. We need to do what we can to help these young uh, farmers. And it's not like he wanted to, she just wanted to go into farming. No, he grew up in the farm and he's exactly the kind of person that we want to, uh, to, uh, pass on a family farm or become a new farmer. So those who are on board uh, or those who can help me uh, message me off uh, line and we'll look forward to the old McDonald's song <laughs> sung by Chair Listigard. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Representative McDonald. Next Thank up, you. we have uh, Representative Moran. Thank you, Chair Listigard. Um, so I, I first want to thank uh, Chair Marquardt for bringing this bill forward, um, creating a, a tax credit for farmers is a great idea and much needed um, in the era of the pandemic and all the other uh, pandemics that has been happening uh, in Minnesota and across the country. Uh, I want to also thank Miss. I think I hope I uh, pronounced her name right, Miss Kohler, who uh, presented and talked on the bill, and really raised up the inequities that we have saw historically for farmers of color, specifically, from my vantage point, from Black farmers here in. Uh, America, and that includes Minnesota. And I just wanted to share just a little bit information because it's really important, you know, when uh, that we have knowledge and information and, and the history of who we are, because if we do not as legislators in the 21st century, we will repeat, we will repeat the ills of the past from former legislators who put laws and policies in place that created inequities back out in our communities across the state of Minnesota. And so for a little, give me a, a, a few moments just to do a little history moment here, because um, I just want to say that to, uh, today there are just about 45,000 African-Americans uh, farmers, but just in like 1920, there was nearly a million black farmers nearly a million black farmers. And I wanna talk about a young man by the name of uh, John Boyd Jr. Uh, who is the son of a slave who slept with the deed of his farm under his mattress because he worried constantly that his land would be taken from him. And so, you know, um, and I just shared that and I would just stop that with the history because there was many black farmers where their land was actually taken from them, or they would go to the bank and could not get a loan. Not only could they not get a loan, but nor could they be heard or respected for the land that they own. And so just, you know, my question was, was going to be, um, and, I, and I don't need to know the question because if it's a tax credit, it is there for anyone to apply for, the, for to, to utilize the tax credit that is in place. But we need to know that, you know, as we are moving bills through this body, uh, no one is trying to be divisive, but we are trying to be more informed legislators. Because I want to remind legislators in this body that the inequities and the disparity and the racism and structural racism that we saw in the past was created by policy makers who created laws that was unjust, that was unfair. And we have an obligation today, lawmakers, to make things, make sure that we do no further harm as we move forward. So I just wanna thank you, uh, uh, Chair Listigar, for allowing me to speak. I do wanna thank uh, Representative Marquardt for bringing this uh, bill for it's a good bill. Thank you, Representative uh, Moran, for your words and putting things into uh, context. So, um, next up, we have uh, Representative Her. Thank you, Chair Liz Lagarde, and I and uh, I really appreciate uh, Chair Moran's um, comments that she just made. Um, having just been in front of this committee yesterday and being yelled at for lecturing people, I was a little bit surprised at a lecture that we just received about structural and systemic racism and, and uh, for people who live it every single day to hear those with great deal of privilege lecture us 
on uh, what a bill does and does not do. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Ms. Kohler for bringing up the real true fact about the systemic and structural racism around owning land, and uh, earning wealth, and being able to pass that down to the future generations. I want us to remember that in addition to what Representative uh, R R Moran talked about, that uh, you know, this land originally belonged to Native Americans, and that land was taken from them. And then when African Americans were given land, that land was taken from them. And our uh, Southeast Asian farmers, they are the ones that are upholding all of the farmers markets, the majority of the farmers markets across this state. And those farmers don't get to own land. They have not had the privilege of building wealth and being able to invest that wealth so that they can own that. They rent those land, they work the land, they get just whatever profits and if, uh, from their uh, sales of the produce. And if should something happen, they don't get to, it's just like our small business owners in, in St. Paul. They don't own their buildings. They don't own that land. So if something happens to it, they have no wealth that they can generate or that they can sell or that they can be able to start themselves over again. They've lost it. And so these types of bills, what, what Chair Marquardt brought forward is really important. And I really appreciate the fact that um, this was brought forward. And uh, I want to remember that if people don't like to be lectured in this committee, they probably shouldn't be lecturing back to other people as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative Hur. Next, we have Representative Hurtaz. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Marquardt. Uh, on the right track here for uh, certainly a declining population of farmers, and we're going to need people to be on the farm in the future. I had a constituent uh, the last couple of years I was trying to help and work with, uh, maybe even uh, thought of uh, helping them personally in terms of of uh, being able to acquire land and farm, but uh, the red tape and the problems with the existing Minnesota farm program and the aid that was there uh, was uh, untenable and he couldn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't overcome those barriers, uh, even though he wasn't a minority. Uh, so he just didn't qualify. Um, but he was able to go to Iowa and Iowa has a more robust program and he now is a happy farm owner and farming in Iowa. So maybe we should uh, investigate what Iowa's program is and uh, maybe see if we can't incorporate it and be more inclusive uh, for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Hurtas. Um, Representative Abaji. Thank you so much, Chair Lissagard. Um, I just wanna say again, thank you, Chair Marquardt for bringing this bill forward. You know. Our role as legislators is to solve problems. And when we see a problem, we go in and fix it. And what we do know is that it's difficult for young farmers to get into farming, um, whether they've been in it as a family business or whether they want to come in it um, from a group that has been historically disenfranchised from farming. So I appreciate that this bill wants to make farming much more enticing to young people, but also much more open, um, particularly to black farmers and other farmers of color. Um, we know that they have been systemically shut out of farming um, from being denied loans uh, to even having their farms stolen. And in fact, one of the largest civil lawsuits is, uh, it's titled Pig Ford v. Glickman, so I encourage people to look that up, is one of the largest civil lawsuit settlements. And it is about funding black farmers because they were explicitly disenfranchised and discriminated against by our United States government. So I think a bill like this is a step forward in starting to repair those harms and also making sure that all people who want to have closeness with the land have an ability to farm and have an ability to come into that industry while not having to uh, be prohibited because of the cost to entry of capital investments that it takes to farm. So thank you again, Charlie Marquardt, for bringing this forward. Thank you, Representative Abaji, for those words. Um, our last um, is Chair Davids. Well, thank you very much, Chair Lisselgard. And after all those lectures, I just want to get back to what the bill actually does. Chair Marker, could you just briefly, we, we've gone way far afield here, and I've been lectured to quite a bit today here, but what, could you sum up exactly what this bill does? Uh, so, Chair Marquardt. So, uh, Representative Lisselgard, and and Chair Davis, could I do that in closing comments rather than now? Mr. Um, Chairman. To Mr. save Chairman, some time. You're the chairman. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Any further you. comments, uh, Chair Davis? 
Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve the right to talk again because I see another hands of another lecture. Okay, uh, seeing no more. No, nope. yes, uh, Representative Her. Chair Lissagard, I would like to address this body and the constant condescension from uh, Minority Chair. Uh, I, it is unacceptable that he can continually sit here and point fingers at people for lecturing, and yet he is constantly lecturing. That is unacceptable behavior from somebody who thinks that they know better than everybody else within this committee. Mr. Unacceptable. Chair, okay. Chair, I am not done speaking. I am not done speaking. What is the issue before us? What bill is before us, Mr. Chair? Okay, so let, let's hold let's hold on here, please, everyone. Chair Liz Lagarde uh, is trying to manage through some very passionate um, viewpoints and uh, different styles of leadership. Well, I appreciate that. I'm going off of Chair Marcord's demeanor and decor in this body and in this committee. And that is exactly where we're gonna stay. If individuals wanna have a sidebar conversation, you do that, but it's not gonna be in this committee. Stick to the subject matter. Thank you. Representative Her. Thank you, Chair Lagarde, and that's all I'm asking for, is people to stop making commentaries on other people's they, behavior and, and, and accusing them of intentions. Mr. Chair, thank, you, thank you, thank you, Representative. We are Mr. going Chair. to closing comments. Thank you. thank you, Chair, appreciate that, thank you. We're going to closing comments. Representative Marquardt, to your bill, closing comments, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, this bill is, I want to allow everyone, no matter who you are, uh, to have a chance to uh, get into farming. And that's what this bill does. That's the intent of the original law. And I think this expands it uh, and uh, looks at ways to um, get more people involved in this very important industry and, and keep farming alive and strong in Minnesota. So members, I renew my uh, motion on House File to lay over House File 1456 as amended uh, for possible inclusion into the House Omnibus Tax Bill. I'm so shook up, I forgot to hit the mute button. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Marcord. Chair Marcord renews his motion uh, that House File 1456 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, the next bill we have is 2114 from Chair Marcord. Chair Marcord, would you like to move your bill? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. I'd like to move House File 2114 be laid over for possible inclusion into the House Omnibus Tax Bill. Chair Marcord moves that House File 2114 be laid over for possible inclusion. We have the bill before us. Please present your bill, Chair Marcord. So thank you very much. Members, House File 2114 is a bill uh, about bringing corporate profits that are earned in Minnesota and should be apportioned in Minnesota, uh, but are shifted uh, to other uh, multinational subsidiaries and bring those tax dollars back uh, to Minnesota. But maybe even more important, it's a bill about uh, competitive fairness for small businesses. Because uh, as I kind of describe what is occurring here with profit shifting, is it puts our small businesses, our small Main Street businesses at a huge disadvantage because they're not able to shift profits that are earned in Minnesota out to their subsidi subsidiaries or their controlled foreign corporations. And in many cases, these small businesses are uh, competing directly with these multinational corporations. So um, for members who have been here uh, last year and that, I apologize. But what I do really want to do is go over kind of what is the history and the background of profit shifting and what has been kind of the efforts by the federal government and others to address it. And I know some of you have heard this already. <laughs> some of you are aware of this bill, but I know there's a lot in the public uh, that are watching and others that want it. So, you know, what is profit shifting? And that is what this bill really uh, addresses. 
And that is when a domestic U.S. corporation here in the U.S. Uh, shifts profits that are earned in the United States, but they use various uh, methods to shift those profits to low tax nations. Mm -hmm. And they need to do this through controlled foreign corporations. They have to have subsidiaries in other nations uh, to set this up. And so what this ends up doing is eroding and lessening the United States corporate tax base and ultimately Minnesota's corporate tax base. And so how big of a problem is it? Um, back when the federal government was looking at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office said that profit shifting probably is about $350 billion of income a year. Oh, no, $300 billion a year. And they thought with some of the provisions put in uh, the Tax Cuts and Job Act, that this might reduce it some to maybe roughly about $235 billion of profit shifting a year. A recent kind of paper on research on that said it really, uh, the federal uh, bill in 2017 hasn't really reduced the amount of profit shifting, but the paper did say in the long run, it probably would reduce it 12 to 16%. So we're still in the 235 to $250 billion range of profit shifting. And how do we know that these dollars are being shifted? So in 2014, uh, multinational corporations had to report their profits and where from. And in 2014, US um, corporations said they had $96 billion worth of profits uh, in one country, in Bermuda. And yet the entire GDP, gross domestic product in Bermuda is 6 billion. 96 billion of profits, only 6 billion total country GDP. And in the Cayman Islands, the US corporations reported $40 billion of profits. And yet there's only $3 billion of total in the whole country of gross domestic products. So we know that uh, those are totally profits earned through profit shifting. It's not because of any ac economic activity that's occurred in those countries. And a lot of times we refer to those countries as tax havens. So how is the, the profit shifting occurring? So probably the, there's several ways, but the one that's probably the most prevalent is when a domestic corporation here in the United States will transfer what's called intellectual or intangible property. And those could be trademarks, drug formulas, patents, copyrights, naming rights, um, dom uh, internet domain names, uh, those things that are, are tough to value and so forth. And what they'll do is they'll transfer those uh, to one of their controlled foreign corporations in a low tax nation. And then what they will do is they will either lease them back or pay royalty fees or buy back those rights. And so what that does is it increases the domestic corporation's expenses, which increases their deductions, which ultimately leads to lower income. So the income was earned, but by transferring out this intangible or intellectual property, they're able to, and then buying it back or leasing it back or whatever they do through royalty fees and such, they're able to increase their expenses, which lowers their income. Uh, and so, um, you know, is this legal? Absolutely, it's legal. Uh, but is it right? And does it create huge competitive uh, disadvantage, it creates huge uh, competitive disadvantages. And so the federal government has dealt with this issue for over 40 years. In fact, in the early 1980s, there were 12 states that were using what was called worldwide combined reporting. And that is actually Representative Howard's bill. And they were doing this. And um, there's 1983 Supreme Court case that backed up the constitutionality of this approach. But some of the 
foreign countries and, and the corporations, they pressured Congress and Congress went to these states and they said in the early 1980s, they said, you know, if you kind of do away with your worldwide reporting plans, we're gonna do all we can to eliminate this base erosion and we're gonna end this profit shifting. Well, 35 years went by and the problem only got worse. And so finally in 2017, President Trump and the Republican Congress uh, were looking at doing major tax reform. They understood that this was a huge problem, especially since the federal government in that act went to a territorial system on federal taxation, which means now you only get taxed in your foreign nation. And they thought, well, boy, with this, we better do some things. And so they came up with a tool. Uh, the Fed, President Trump and Congress came up with something called Global Intangible Low Tax Income, otherwise known as GILTY. And I'm sure they had someone working overtime to come up with that acronym in Congress. But anyway, that's what it is. And there's a formula. And it's basically, if there is a kind of what's called a supernormal income in relationship to the property assets you have in any nation, it's over 10%. They basically say, you know what, that's got to be um, profits earned from you know, the transfer of intellectual property and isn't, it's too much for the property you have there. It raises this red flag uh, that in fact, this is money that even though it was earned here in the US is being shifted out uh, and the profits being shifted out to another nation. Uh, so uh, they put this in place. And so, what the, so that's kind of the background of why we got to guilty. So the big question now uh, is House File 2114. What we do with House File 2114 is we use the federal, the federal government's definition of guilty. And if a controlled foreign corporation triggers guilty, we consider that corporate foreign, uh, controlled foreign corporation, a domestic corporation. We bring it into the domestic corporation. We pair the income, and then we apportion that uh, as we do the percent of all sales that were done in Minnesota, as we do currently, and then we take that and times it by the corporate rate. So basically, we are bringing that income in, considering it a domestic corporation, we apply the very same rules, the very same standards to that controlled foreign corporation as we do to a domestic corporation and with all uh, the benefits. So uh, if though, there's one other provision in this bill, if a, a company says, you know what, that one corn foreign corporation isn't representative of all of our subsidiaries around the world, they can elect if they want, to go to worldwide combined reporting. And they have to elect that for 10 years. So whatever one would benefit them the most, they can do that. So what is the revenue estimate for the bill? It's $435 billion uh, for 22, 23, and 381 million for 24, 25. And so while this raises a lot of revenue, it's because it's a big problem. It's a big problem. But this bill isn't about revenue. It's about returning those dollars back to Minnesota that were rightfully earned there. And it's about increasing uh, competition or leveling the playing field for these small businesses who compete with these multinational corporations. And yet uh, they're seeing increased taxes uh, because these dollars aren't coming in uh, to the state uh, to be used for other services and so forth. Um, so uh, members, um, you know, we've got to do something. Uh, this is an area of our tax policy that is broken and we cannot allow uh, corporations to just kind of arbitrarily set uh, the amount of income that's going to be apportioned to Minnesota, the United States. And we also can't rely on the federal government uh, to do any more as far as enforcement. And so the federal government has given us this tool on guilty 
and that's what we're uh, going to use. So members, thank you very much for your patience and kind of going through the history and so forth. But that is the bill and I'll open for questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Marquardt. So um, we have testifiers, we have a half an hour and we have another bill. I'm gonna set the parameter right now. Each testifier has three minutes. I will have a stopwatch that I will hit and with their 20 seconds left, I will let you know, I'll say 20, so you can wind down and I'd be greatly appreciated. All questions will be held until the end. And our first um, testifier is Ms. Foley. Welcome to the committee and please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, uh, Mr. Chairman, members, thank you for having me. And I would just like to take this moment to acknowledge uh, Representative Her and Representative Moore, and thank you for uh, calling out racism and misogyny. I really appreciate it and I see you. Um, I am a member of Main Street Alliance of Minnesota. I own Phoenix Grove Systems located in Anoka. We are a bookkeeping firm that works with small businesses. I have been doing this work since 2011. I have worked with at least 30 businesses during this time and I focus on uh, our business is intentionally inclusive and we focus on working with uh, business owners from underrepresented and marginalized communities. As a small business owner, I can say that this measure would not negatively impact our small business None of my revenue is sheltered abroad. None of my clients or contacts shelter their income in tax havens. A value of small businesses is that we generate income for local economies. We employ locally. We partner with other local businesses. Our customers are often local. Instead of harming small businesses, as might be claimed, this measure could help small businesses. This measure would tax big business. This would create a more level playing field for small businesses. Minnesota needs additional ongoing revenue to fund and create programs that support small businesses. This would give us the additional permanent revenue we need to fund access to healthcare, childcare, and funding capital for small businesses. Entrepreneurs take big risks when we start our businesses. There are very few, if any, safety nets. The pandemic highlighted this. A lot of us don't have health insurance. I don't have health insurance, and I know quite a few fellow entrepreneurs that don't either. MinCare and MinSure are inadequate for our needs. My premium, premiums on MinSure were raised from 45 a month in 2018 to 200 a month in 2019. That's more than a 400% increase and was for worse coverage. To be clear, my income did not increase in a comparable amount. In fact, my income was down in 2019. It just wasn't affordable. A lot of small business owners, their families, and their employees would be more financially secure if the state made investments that put affordable, high quality health insurance within reach, like Representative Schultz's bill to allow individuals and small businesses to opt into medical care. This would give more opportunities for current and new entrepreneurs, particularly those from underrepresented and marginalized communities. Please support HF 2114. Thank you. Ms. Foley, that was incredible and efficient. Um, I want to thank you for that. Um, I just been notified by um, powers that be that uh, we can push uh, House File 2228, the Howard Bill, uh, to this evening if we um, don't make it. So, next up, Ms. Dice, please, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Yes, um, thank you. My name is Darwin Dice. I live in the country just outside of Ghent, Minnesota, where I raise chickens and host a community garden. I'm speaking in favor of House File 2114, partly because one of the big hurdles to passing legislation that helps people is we don't have enough in the budget. And those stalemates impact people who are really trying to get on their feet. I know personally of situations in my rural community where low-income folks who need programs like SNAP get cut off because they save precious dollars to buy a car, a pretty important thing in rural Minnesota. We need a car to get to the grocery store, obtain emergency medical services, get kids to after-school activities, etc. Um, also, I have friends who ration medicine and healthcare visits because they don't make the cut for Minnesota Care. Yes, such programs require the state to invest dollars, 
but the hardworking farmers, community members, and small businesses around me don't benefit when tax loopholes allow extremely well-off corporate entities to hide their money. Allowing the corporate world to hide exorbitant profits in hidden tax shelters enables taxable income to be withheld from supporting essential things like infrastructure, affordable housing, schools, uh, developing broadband so desperately needed here in rural Minnesota. We've got a high school student living with us who at times struggled with class participation, not because of lack of interest, but because of lack of internet speed. How many small business startups have we lost because of lack of broadband service? People in rural Minnesota spend their money to survive, which means it circulates in the economy instead of sitting in a hidden offshore account. I support closing loopholes, be it through HF 2114 or any other tax bill that closes loopholes, leaving more dollars in our community. I'm proud to live in this state, especially when we do not see our interests or struggles as separate from one another and take on the challenge to find greater balance and equity. House File 2114 works to do just that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dice. Very well done yourself, time-wise. Um, next, we have Ms. Larson. Welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Jill Larson with the Minnesota Business Partnership. My comments are directed at both House File 2114 and 2228 um, um, in, to save on time. The, while the bills aren't identical, they both deal with the concept of worldwide reporting and we have some concerns with Minnesota moving to that uh, tax system. This would be a significant change in corporate tax policy. It would make Minnesota an extreme outlier and would have really negative impacts on a lot of Minnesota's headquartered companies. No other state has worldwide reporting. And while technically not mandatory, House File 2114 essentially is that um, because of the way that the language is structured. We have concerns and questions about how the Department of Revenue would actually administer this new policy. Um, House File 2114 gives the department um, broad authority to determine the unitary standard, which is unprecedented. Moving to a system of worldwide reporting would result in an extreme complexity of filing, added costs for both taxpayers and the department, probably be very difficult for the, the department to audit worldwide income. Um, foreign subsidiaries don't have the same reporting requirements. And so it's just, it just adds a lot of complexity. But more important than that is that um, these, these proposals would make Minnesota less competitive and essentially penalize a lot of mid Minnesota headquartered businesses. You know, like non-US companies, Minnesota, these Minnesota companies are competing around the world for, for business opportunities, for customers, for sales. And wherever those Minnesota companies operate, they are paying local taxes, whether it be income taxes, excise taxes, et cetera. Um, but non-US companies are not required to pay tax on income earned outside their own jurisdiction, as these bills would require Minnesota companies to pay. So this essentially puts Minnesota companies at a competitive disadvantage versus non-US companies when they compete for business and investment. It essentially favors foreign-based companies. So it would be a big tax increase in a lot of Minnesota companies. We think that Minnesota should be working to encourage exports, encourage expansion into global markets, not penalize that expansion, not impede the ability of Minnesota's companies to compete. Um, when, we, when these companies do expand, it creates good paying jobs here in Minnesota. So for these reasons, Mr. Chairman, um, we, we do oppose both, uh, both of the bills. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Larson. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Nicely. I hope I'm saying that right. Welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. You got my name exactly right. I'm just like the adverb. Um, you must be a nice guy. Uh, well, you know, um, it, it all depends on the issue, right? <laughs> what perspective? Well, we'll find out here. You got three minutes to whether you're nice or not. All right. Uh, well, uh, you know, thank you very much. You know, I um, really um, echo a lot of um, Ms. Larson's concerns with House File um, 2114 and also House File 2028. And both uh, do have uh, integrated concepts of worldwide um, reporting. Um, the Council on State Taxation, in, in case um, some of you are not aware of us, we are a nonprofit trade organization. We're based in Washington, D.C., and we re represent um, most of the Fortune 500 members. And we are not about no taxation. 
Um, we are about fair and equitable taxation for multi-jurisdictional businesses. And we want um, both small and large businesses to thrive. Um, our goal here is not to hinder small um, businesses whatsoever to make sure all businesses can thrive. Um, you know, one thing I, I do want to note um, and, and make sure everyone realizes this is Minnesota's corporate income tax for the most recent figures that we have uh, looking at fiscal years 2018 um, compared to 2019, the corporate income tax base actually increased by 21%. This is over um, the state um, average uh, at the national level, which um, we saw from 2018 to 2019, it was a 17% increase. And a lot of this is related to the federal tax changes in 2017 that uh, Chair Marquardt had um, discussed. Um, so, you know, based on that, we don't see any urgency, um, a need for this massive change in how corporations are taxed in Minnesota. Specific concerns related to House File 2, um, 2114 is how it um, treats controlled foreign corporations um, in that it looks like it cherry picks um, those entities that are creating guilty. However, if you have um, other CFCs that have losses, they would not be included in this approach. Now, there is an election to do worldwide combi combination, but just on its own, um, 2114, um, if you uh, only had to include those creating guilty, that it looks very much like it's one-sided um, and, and could be very unequitable. We're also very concerned with the revenue estimate. The revenue estimate um, appears to be based on um, other states that have tax haven um, provisions and um, you know, looking at those having an 11% increase. And I know Montana is one state that uh, has a tax haven provision. I don't think um, they've uh, been able to show where they've had 11% increase in their base. Uh, addressing um, House File 2228, um, with, which would require combined reporting, you know, we really look at this as um, taking a step backward. And I know, um, you know, Chairman McCord, you had mentioned how there was 12 other states that used to have this. Um, you know, they did all eliminate it. Um, there was a lot of pressure, um, as um, you had indicated, in the 1970s and the 1980s from foreign corporations and also from multi-jurisdictional um, businesses to eliminate... Um, 20 seconds. And, um, you know, I just want to say, you know, that uh, when we want Minnesota to thrive um, and we want uh, Minnesota to remain competitive um, and not place uh, businesses at a competitive disadvantage. Um, so uh, when it's appropriate time, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nicely. Um, okay, member questions for any of the testifiers um, or Chair Marquardt? And it looks like we have uh, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this question goes to um, Chair Marquardt. Um, could you explain again to, I, I follow you. You're probably the only one that can explain this to me. So I appreciate that, <laughs> I appreciate that. But you, could you explain again that how Minnesota is a single apportionment state and how, um, how this works with that? Chair Marquardt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and Chair Joachim. So we are a single sales factor state, which means we only calculate uh, the amount of sales a corporation does. So your payroll or your property doesn't make any difference at all. And so that's why if, if you look at, you know, companies wouldn't relocate because it's based on sales. I mean, you can't take your customers and, you know, with you, so to speak. And, and so the apportionment, portion of it then is you figure out if you've got a company that does a million dollars of sales throughout the United States, let's say, uh, but does a hundred thousand in Minnesota, uh, you would apportion it at 10%. That would be 10%. And so that way, of course, this federal, this corporation doesn't get taxed, you know, many times over what they make. So it's apportioned based upon the percent of Minnesota sales versus their overall sales. And so when you bring in this corporate um, foreign, uh, controlled foreign corporation, you would combine the income, but you also combine the sales. So the fact that none of the sales on this CFC were done in Minnesota, it would actually lower your apportionment of sales, but the amount of income could go up. So there's a, you know, a factor, a multiplication there that has to take. Follow-up of Representative Joachim? 
No, thank you. That helps. It makes me realize that this really wouldn't force uh, companies out of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Sandell. Thank you, Chair Lisgard and uh, um, Representative Marquardt. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions about, I, um, I'm a little confused. Um, first question is, um, would, we, would Minnesota be taxing proportionately the profits made on sales in other, in other states? That's the first question. Second of all, um, how many of these Minnesota corporations are you talking about? And, and could you identify one or two or three? Thank you. Ch Chair Marquardt. Yeah, um, so first question is, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Sandell. So it would not impact any of the income from inside the United States. It doesn't impact that one bit. And so, you know, a lot of these companies that might do um, the profit shifting through naming rights, and that could be uh, drug companies, software companies. Um, you know, I know Apple, you know, when we had deemed repatriation, I think they had, they were the largest one for bringing back foreign profits and not saying all of those were shifted, uh, but those would be the type of businesses or corporations. Representative Sandell. Thank you. I just quickly, uh, uh, Chair Lissigard, um, would this, um, um, affect corporations selling, um, goods um, such as refrigerators or whatever, or uh, would it also include um, corporations or partnerships making financial tra um, transactions and where the product may be simply a, a, a financial investment? Chair Marquardt. So uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Sandow, remember this is only activated is if, if the corporate or the controlled foreign corporation uh, activates guilty, which is section 951 of the IRS code. So, you know, I'd have to dig into that a, a more on that specifically, but if it triggers that, which means their income is more than 10% of basically tangible assets that they have in this country, it is just signifying, sending up the red flag that this is probably profit shifting. And so, uh, I, I guess I can't answer that specifically, uh, but it, it would be contained in Section 951 of the IRS Code. Any follow-up, Representative Sandell? Just last, I, I, I'm sure you know, uh, Representative Marquardt, that I support uh, the bill and, and the conversations that we've had about uh, things like this. But my concern is, of course, that I don't want to um, um, penalize Minnesota companies um, at the, uh, I, sh I should say, I want to, um, I want to support Minnesota companies um, because so many of our products, of course, are, are coming from um, Southeast Asia and China. And, um, you know, the hockey sticks I used to buy that were made in War Road are now uh, made in Vietnam. And, and, and I don't know why we chased the Person Brothers out of, out of War Road. But thank you very much. I appreciate the, the, I appreciate the bill, uh, Paul, and our Representative uh, Marquardt. And uh, thanks, uh, Representative uh, Wilson. Thank you, Representative Sandell. Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Chair Marquardt, um, I oppose this bill. And um, usually the narrative is, is when a middle-aged white guy Republican opposes a bill like this, we're, we're trying to defend big business. That's the narrative, right? Well, I actually defend the consumer on this. Um, members and other people listening, corporations don't pay their taxes. Their customers do. That cost gets shifted down to the next level because they're going to have profits that they're expected to have and what have you. And we can go into whether businesses move or not, but the bottom line is, is that when we find new ways to tax these businesses, the consumer ends up paying for that in the end. And I'd also like to add that Minnesota has enough tax revenue also, and we're talking about increasing tax revenue. Members, we, we don't have, we don't have, um, uh, we don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. So I think we need to find ways to lessen the burden on the consumers here in Minnesota and not increase it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank Chair. you. Uh, Chair Marquardt. Mr. Chair and Representative Miller, you, you bring up a great point. And uh, the DOR, when they look at tax incidents on business, says it's regressive and a lot of it falls on consumers. 
But the Department of Revenue has also indicated that when it comes to national and foreign uh, corporation, it's a different story. In, in fact, what they say here, and this was from um, a tax incident report on the 2018 tax bill, it says, quote, businesses selling in national or international markets are much less likely to shift the added cost to consumers by raising prices uh, or to reduce the price in response. Um, we know, and a lot of folks are recalibrating all of this because foreign, or excuse me, corporations in Minnesota received a 40% tax cut in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act when the corporate rate went from 35 to 21. And yet we didn't see a lowering of prices. And what we saw actually, according to the Federal Reserve, is that stock buybacks from the fourth quarter of 2017 to the first quarter of 2018 went from $23 billion to $55 billion. So a lot of it was put back into the company. And so I, have, I share your concerns with uh, regressivity and so forth, but when it comes to something like this, where you're talking about international corporate dollars, uh, scholars and even the Department of Revenue says that might uh, be a little different. And the last thing is I want to emphasize is this, this, while it raises a large proportion of revenue, this isn't about revenue. This is really, you have your small businesses that are competing with these global corporations and they're selling the same product, but they're paying more in taxes than what they should be in comparison uh, to this corporation that has the means to be able to shift it. Now, again, it's legal. These We have great corporate partners in, in Minnesota, uh, but you know, I, I've heard kind of concerns about you know, what it might be doing, but I haven't heard anyone say, how are we going to fix the problem? This is one way in which we fix the problem. And I'm not, these are domestic dollars that should be taxed in Minnesota. They should be taxed in Minnesota, everything else being equal, but they're able to shift that out. And not only does that increase taxes for our businesses, but it decreases the amount of resources we have for our schools and healthcare and public safety and all the other areas. So this, I know it raises a lot of revenue, but it's trying to fix the problem because it's a big problem. These are dollars that should be a portion of Minnesota. Uh, Chair Lizagard. Representative Miller. Uh, Chair Lizagard and, and Chair Marcourt, we can, we can somewhat resolve that issue by lessening the tax burden on our local businesses as well, which are entirely overtaxed in the state of Minnesota too. Thank you for your comments, Representative Miller. Anyone else uh, from any member wanna uh, ask a question, say a comment? Seeing none, closing comments, Chair Marquardt. No, well, members, uh, Mr. Chair and members, thank you for this. I just, uh, this is something we need to address. The federal government has tried to address it and they set it up so that this income passes down to the states. And they've given the states a tool uh, to be able to address this problem. And I think this is one way, a uh, fair way to do that. So members, uh, thanks for the debate again. I would renew my motion to lay over House File 2114 for possible inclusion into the House on this tax bill. Thank you, Chair Marcord. Chair Marcord renews his motion that House File 2114 be laid over for possible inclusion and the bill is laid over. I will now hand the virtual gavel, hammer, whatever you want to call it, back to uh, Chair Marcord. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Les Lagarde. So members, uh, we're gonna stop at this point. Uh, we're gonna have three bills when we come back. We will hear uh, Representative Howard's bill, uh, Representative Hansen's bill, and Representative Les Lagarde's bill when we come back. And that will be at 6 um, p.m. So um, Chair Davis. Thank you, Chair Marquardt. I'm continuing to receive, and I know we're recessed until this evening, receive uh, emails and so forth from uh, CPA firms from around the state. And you can imagine what the issue is. It's the PP and the taxes on, from the taxes are not taxing unemployment. Do you foresee us doing something? And again, uh, my side of that will totally stand down if we could just get these through. The money's there. 
or do you see this going to the third week of May? So thank you, Chair Davids. So I have control over our tax bill. And so, I mean, right now we're looking at having a tax bill posted and out the first week uh, in April, right after the Easter Passover break. Um, if leadership uh, was to come to some sort of an agreement, and I think there would be more than just the Paycheck Protection Program, we're ready to go. I mean, we could put things together uh, quickly, but that uh, is a leadership uh, question at this time. We will be doing conformity, not only on the PPP, but also the unemployment insurance and then other areas that we've talked about here in the committee. But that's about all I can tell you at this point, Chair Davis. And, and, and I really appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. And, and I do know that we have the Senate file 55 to 12 and passed over there. So I'm, I'm hoping, and I'll encourage leadership to uh, at least bring that up. Let's get that out of the way, then we can work on the Islanders tax bill. But I'm not going to lecture you. We'll <laughs> see you later. Representative Hurtas. Uh, I won't lecture either. Mr. Chair, um, regarding tonight and uh, the additional bills, uh, I had a question on House File 1733. That was a bill that um, uh, imposes fees on transactions uh, related to real estate transactions, uh, recording documents at the county level. And uh, I was just wondering why we didn't uh, have that referred or why it wasn't heard in property tax committee. That certainly seems like that should have been uh, in our purview. You've been really uh, straightforward in uh, making those referrals to our committee, but uh, this, is, this is one that clearly uh, involves property and property taxes and uh, recording of mortgages and mortgage deeds and, and uh, is just that um, a situation that uh, is local governments, counties would be be imposing a fee they would have the discretion so i'm just wondering if you had a reason why that was not being referred to property tax and why you're hearing it in the tax committee instead representative hurtas you are exactly right it normally would have gone to property taxes and it's mainly uh, a timing issue by the time it came out of one of the committees they had to hear and this well it's not common it does occur where we do hear things kind of late like this where Basically, the property tax divisions kind of wrap things up. And um, so we, we take it to taxes. You're right. It, you know, in the best of all worlds, it would have gone to property tax division first. But just with timing, um, we couldn't do that. Okay. Um, well, thanks for that explanation. And Mr. Chair, uh, uh, I had the unfortunate uh, conversation this morning of uh, hearing from one of our members who had a TIF bill that uh, got introduced uh, kind of late and was uh, wanting to uh, see if that could get included in the division report. And I indicated to him that it's maybe a little uh, late to come to the party and uh, his community certainly came late to the party. But uh, if that's the case with this bill that we might hear it in taxes, maybe uh, there's an opportunity to include one more little one paragraph, five year extension to the TIF in the tax bill. <laughs> and Representative Hurtas, I will tell you, we've been getting late notices from both sides of the aisle that we <laughs> had to turn down. But this is one bill that has gone through at least one committee, if not kind of two already, and it's got to get back uh, to the Environment Committee, to the author. And so, um, nope, I, I hear you, Representative Hurtas, and don't disagree with the thing, but it's just kind of a timing and so forth. So. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. We, you and I seldom we disagree. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Representative McDonald. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. See, uh, how much time do you anticipate for tonight's meeting? Uh, Representative just McDonald, curious, just I would say, I mean, I would say at least an hour or more. I would say at least an hour probably between these. Probably, you know, 20, 30 minutes for each bill, I would say, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then Representative Listegard. Uh, Representative Lestegard, you have a question for Representative Lestegard? Yes. Representative yeah, Lestegard. Representative Listergard, uh, sorry to do it this fashion, but could you give me a call regarding your bill tonight? Very good. Uh, yes. We're, we, we are up at 2.30. We've got to close here. So members, we'll Thank see you. you back at 6 o'clock. We're recessed until 6.